This is the Danger Close Podcast. Beyond the Books with me, Jack Carr. Welcome to the Danger Close Podcast, an Iron Cloud original presented by Six Hour. This is a very special four part series of Danger Close with my guest, my dear friend, Mark Owen. It's titled The Head of the Snake Killing Osama bin Laden. And if you've been following Mark Owen's story for a while, you know that he hasn't given too many interviews. So I am deeply honored that he would sit down with me to tell this story. We've known each other for over 20 years now, and he told me that there is no one that he would sit down and tell this to other than me. So you're not going to hear a lot of this anywhere else. And plus, it was just a great time catching up with an old friend. So this part one, we talk about his upbringing in Alaska and really up to September 11th. So sit back, grab a drink, and enjoy this first part of a four-part series with Mark Owen. Let's go back to the beginning. Um, Alaska. Is that, what are your first memories? Are they of Alaska? Uh, yeah. I mean, I, you know this. Uh, I grew up in a, a remote village in the middle of nowhere in Alaska. My parents were Christian missionaries. So, you know, graduated high school with three people in my senior class. I always brag that I was the valedictorian, as you know. <laughs> <laughs> I remember the, the prom picture, I think. It was. Yeah, no, we didn't have a prom. No, was, no prom some, at all. Some sort of a picture with you and your date. <laughs> oh, yeah. She was from the village down the river. <laughs> I remember. I, I remember mean, drive my snowmobile down to go see her. That's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. It's Hunt a, for your food. Yeah. I bought my first rifle from my history teacher at school. Love that. Put the gun in my locker till the end of the day. You know, pretty sure that doesn't happen anywhere. Uh, it anymore. might still happen there. In Alaska, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, maybe. I mean, our our high school mascot, and it's still to this day, right? The village I grew up in was Antioch, the name Antioch, right? Our our school is the Antioch Halfbreeds. Wow, and that, that hasn't changed. They're very proud of their heritage. They don't care about what color and shape you are, right? You're either a good person or you're not. And in the in a village in Alaska, they're very proud of that. So wow, they're yeah. changing like. Vikings, and of yeah. course they're changing Indians and, you know, all that sort of thing. Yep. But the half-breeds are still... Mighty, mighty half-breeds. No kidding. <laughs> Google that, it. That might change after this podcast. Yeah, let's hope uh, not. <laughs> that is crazy. And uh, and what age were you when you guys went, went up there? Um, Little to second grade, third grade, okay. little, when my parents moved up. And you have memories of that of that time frame of being uh, A little seven bit. years old, eight years old? Growing up, hunting, fishing, um... You know, driving snowmobiles to school, so very, very different than the way most people grew up. Um, I loved it. Thought it was great. Grew up with, you know, survival skills, you know. Yeah. So I loved it. What was the, first, was the first hunt you went on up there? Um, I mean, that's all we did was go hunting. I, I remember I shot a moose one time when I was little, right? I plugged it a couple times with my twenty two, right? I, I, that clearly wasn't going to kill it. And my, my dad shot it with the odd six or whatever and put uh -huh. it down, but that was my first. Is that the one that went in the river that you have to like, is that later? <laughs> that was another one. <laughs> that was the one, that was the one you had to drag through the, through the river. I remember that. That story. So you guys are up there. You guys are like, you guys are remote. Like there's no roads, right? You're flying in and there's boats on the rivers and that sort of That's thing. That's it. That's it. If you left the village of, you know, 500 people, maybe in the summer, it'd, it'd bump up to 600, 650 people. Okay. But uh, when you left the village, there was nothing. Yeah. So when I was, you know, 16 years old, I'd link up with my buddies and we'd go up the river, three days up the river, guns, fishing poles in a, a tent and catch fish, shoot some critters. And, and that's that it. was our, our good time. Did your parents worry about you or were they just like, um, I, I think because back, we grew back. up there, that's what they were used to, right? Like, yeah. uh, I, I would have trouble trusting a, you know, a 16 year old kid to valet park my car and, you know, in the, in the city setting where I think there, there was, you know, yes, there were wild animals and you were away from, right? We didn't have a hospital. There was no doctors where I grew up. So you were, you were definitely on your own, but I mean, that's the way you were raised. I didn't think of any, any different. 
So if you had something that happened, like, was everyone super, I mean, you have to be super self-reliant, but um, were there people that had certain specialties up there, kind of like you do in a, in a SEAL platoon? Like you have the, you have the medic, you have the, the, the your armorer, you have, you know, your <laughs> Not communications really. guys, everybody just kind of did everything. It was like a public health nurse yeah. in the village who was like certified to, to prescribe penicillin. Wow. <laughs> like that was it. Wow. Other than that, it was a, it was a plane ride yeah. to Anchorage or another bigger village to see the doctor. That is crazy. Did you guys fly? Did you have someone in your family that flew? Yeah, my uh, my mom had her has her pilot's license. My older sister has her pilot's license. I mean, to get from village to village yeah. was either a, a boat with an outboard engine or a, a little Cessna. Um, my my high school actually offered flying lessons. So that's how my that. older sister got her hers. I, I, mean, I was in the program and they ended up shutting it down. It was just so expensive, as oh, you can imagine, right? Yeah. After school, you're 16, that's you've awesome. now soloed. So you can go check out the school plane with the school gas and go fly around all afternoon. That's pretty sweet. It's not bad. No. Not bad. That is awesome. Man, so, that, so that's pretty, I mean, from second grade, third grade, all the way up through high school, you're up there. That's it. That's all I knew. I knew, you know, I knew I didn't want to work in an office. I'd never, never driven on a freeway. Right? I'd never worked a gas pump at a gas station, right? We had a barge that would come up the river and deliver our fuel. So And that's only when you can, like in the winter there's no summer. Right? Yeah, yeah. In the winter, ice freezes up and so you get all your supplies in before that. You get make sure you it. have your gas, your diesel, your your everything that you're gonna need because That's it. You're then, stuck there. And when does winter start? Um geez. Like November? Oh earlier than that, September. Oh, wow. It's getting cold. Um I mean our high school didn't cancel school unless it was 55 below zero or colder, right? And that didn't, didn't, didn't count the wind chill. And I drove a snowmobile to school in the morning. So you, know, you got to get, get your snowmobile started, let it warm up for an hour at that temperature just to get to school. Dang. Fur hats and you know, all that stuff. You throw your AR on there, yeah, just out of your, out of your backpack uh, and zip off to school yeah. on the snow machine. And, yeah. Then, <laughs> and then come back if you see something. So say you're on your way to school and you see a moose or something it's legal boom yeah dang yep that is wild and then uh sports teams like it's hard to feel the team yep there was no tryouts which was great if you're <laughs> as, as athletic as, as i am right i'm 5'10 athletic dude i think i was like the second tallest kid in my high school oh, so man. if you want to play basketball it's like all right you're a starting center here 5'10 that's um, awesome so yeah not a lot of school sports but you know limited Limited season to do what you had to do. <laughs> Did you think you were a lot better than you were because of the... Uh... No, I knew exactly how bad I was. <laughs> that yeah. is awesome. So you're learning all these things. And, and are, is it your dad who's taking you out hunting and teaching you how to field dress yep. and do yep. all that sort my of thing? My dad and then the, the, the locals in the village, right? My, my dad didn't... He grew up in California, right? He didn't know a lot of this stuff. So, so everybody's so learning. Moving up to the village, learning curve was, was vertical. So, right as my mom's learning from the local ladies, my dad's learning to hunt and fish and live off the land, and and I'm a young kid picking all this up as we go. Dang, what what uh, what's in the river right there? What are you fishing for? Salmon, constant. It's all the salmon you could eat right off your front deck. Man, and are bears out there when you're yep. going you see out? bears across the river. I mean, right right in the village, everything was close in the village, but as soon as you left the village, right across the river. I mean, you have stuff walking through town sometimes, but it's all very close. Did anybody have any bear attacks when you were little up there? No. No. No, not, nothing. Not where they were attacking humans. Interesting. And and then at some point along the line, because I've, I've seen pictures, so I've seen you running around up there in camo and, you know, playing army and, uh, and all that sort of thing. At, uh, at what stage do you start thinking about, one, leaving the village, I guess, or what you're going to do in the future? Right. Um, like, like when you're in third grade are you thinking about that sort of thing are you like hey this is this is life and i'm always going to be here because i don't know anything else or by the time you get to like sixth grade you're like hmm this was cool but uh what am i going to do going forward it's interesting because in the village you don't think much outside of the village most of those people live there their whole lives right they they don't leave the village they they may travel a little bit but they're that they're they're there um it was probably middle school that i i read some books for a for a uh a book report at school and, and our, you know, our small school library, I found a book, uh, Men with Green Faces, yeah. uh, Frogmen in, in Vietnam. And so I read that. And as a junior high kid who grew up running around hunting and fishing, and, you know, I read this book. I'm like, okay, these guys serve their country. They live for something bigger than themselves. They lived up to all these challenges. 
they ran around with guns and they didn't have a desk job. They didn't work in a cubicle. And, and at that point, e even in middle school, I knew, okay, I, I didn't see myself leaving the village and moving to a cubicle in LA or, yeah, yeah. or wherever. So that, that intrigued me and that got me reading more books probably yeah. the, the point of the lesson from the teacher yeah. <laughs> did some more reading, yeah. uh, read as many books about the, the military soft community that I could. And, and that's what got me fired up. So was it up until that point where you thinking like military in general before that point, or was it that before that, that I was thinking like Alaska state trooper, fish and game nice. officer, okay. right? You live in the, but something in, remote, in the, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Got remote it. village of Alaska. You're, you know, yeah. That's what you law think about. enforcement, something like that. Yeah. Some carrying a pistola, yeah. Uh, but you're not getting those same influences that a lot of people are getting. Those, uh, yeah, this, these American popular culture influences that are so powerful and continue to be so powerful around the world. Um, and for me, that's like Rambo. That's First Blood. That's Commando. That's Predator. Um, you know, there's all these movies my dad watched uh, when, when he was growing up and a little right. little older, watching like those old war movies like The Longest Day and Hell is for Heroes and uh, things like that. Um, that. So you weren't having those kind of inputs. Or did you guys have a movie theater up there? <laughs> no, no movie theaters, right? And TV, in the village, we had no one TV, TV channel. One TV channel. And it was split between all the networks, right? So CBS, ABC, NBC, they'd all get up a, a equal amount of time and they could air whatever they wanted. So a, a movie night was non-existent. Interesting. Nobody fought over the remote because it was one channel. You weren't changing it anyway. No um, way. Did people like crowd around? Is that in a bar? Like where is this? No, yeah, have... everybody had one in their house. Oh, everybody had one TV. Okay. Yeah, one TV, we have one. Everybody has a TV, we have one channel. One, yeah, yeah, one channel. Is it coming in with the uh, uh, antenna? Yeah. yeah. No way. Yeah. I'm surprised you even had you even had that. Pretty, pretty basic stuff, but yeah, I don't yeah. think I saw any of the Rambo movies until I went to college. And no way, right? College was there's no no universities in Antioch where I grew up in the village. There's a few universities in Alaska, but I think at that point I knew, hey, look, I know this Alaska stuff. Mm -hmm. I, I know the village side of Alaska. Um, you know, living in the city or on the road system was a was a big move. And, and I was wow. like, okay, well, if I'm going to move to a city and a road system to go to university or school, hey, why don't I, I branch out a little more and maybe think outside of Alaska? That's okay. all I knew at this point. And my, uh, my parents had gone to a, a small private school in, in Los Angeles. And so I was like, well, shoot, maybe, maybe I'll try that. So that's where I ended up going to college. Dang, and what do you think, like when you first get down there, what are you, uh, what are you thinking? <laughs> I, I show up in a flannel, nice. with jeans, work boots, like straight from Alaska. Nice. And, and of course, all the Southern California girls are like, who's this guy, what's, what's his problem? I, I believe I even brought a, uh, I'd been bear hunting with my dad before I went to school, and so shot a seven foot black bear. It's pretty good size. There you go. My dad you go. had the head, the head mounted for me, and he sent, it it. Down, he sent it down with me to college. Uh -huh. So I had this bl black bear head mounted in my dorm room, and in, in Southern California, that's fantastic. People are very confused by that. That is fantastic. Yeah. They're like, "Where did you buy that? Is that yeah. you know <laughs> interesting?" It, it, uh, and you had it in uh, after buds too. When you got to Team Five, I remember it was in your oh, yeah. in your place. I carried that around everywhere for you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Where is it now? I don't know. I gave it back to my dad. Oh, did you? <laughs> yeah. Nice. Nice. That is wild. So you're you're now in college, and you read these books in in junior high and in high school. Did you still have your eye on military? Like once you yeah, read that book, kind of all the way. Pretty laser focused. Once I started reading these books, I was like, okay, this this sounds cool. Yeah. What else do I want to do? Nothing. Nothing yeah. else sounded as cool. Nothing else sounded like the challenge. Um, you know, my parents were like, "You're crazy. Don't do it." They'd never been in the military. My dad lived through Vietnam era, saw what happened then, and was just like, "Hey, just." Didn't want me to put my life at risk and, yeah. and that type of thing. Yeah. Um, and nobody in my family had ever been in the military. Oh, wow. But uh, it, it didn't distract me at all. That was what I wanted to do. So college was kind of like, I wanted to get it out of the way, right? I, yeah, I didn't know if I wanted to be an officer. And I didn't know what I didn't know. Yeah, right. But I knew I wanted to get my degree out of the way. Yep. I, I recommend that to everybody I talk to nowadays. They're interested in enlisting or going officer or whatever. I say, mm -hmm. get your degree first. Then you, then you have the opportunities, right? Yeah. You, you used yours. I had my degree. I could have. I, I didn't. Um, it's a good. It's a good foundation, I think, and especially, it's a good transition period to then train for buds. Like that's why I used it for me. Like, same thing. I just wanted to get through as fast as I possibly could, and uh, but also use that time to train 
And at the time, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu was just getting here. So it was like early 90s. No one really heard of it yet. There's no UFC out there yet. So I'm uh, doing all this martial art training, doing all the boxing. I'm just running. I'm putting on the ruck. You know, I'm doing everything that I think is going to prepare me right. for buds. And, uh, and for me, that worked. Like some people get out of high school in the next week, you know, they're in boot camp. And then, right. you know, nine, 12 weeks later, whatever it is, you know, they're in buds and they're just frigging going. Yeah. Um, but for me, I got to continue to study, continue to study warfare. Um, I had a library in my, uh, in my dorm room. <laughs> I know it's a shock. You know, I had all these, uh, all these books and uh, they still have them all today. They're still in the, in the house. Like I've not gotten rid of any of them, but I'm still studying warfare. I'm studying everything on special operations. I'm running, I'm swimming, I'm doing all the martial arts stuff, just doing everything I possibly can. So I think it's, I think it's a, you know, if you're if you're know where you want to go and uh it's a good time to take a breath and leave the house get away from the parents and then study warfare it's a good, train good time to mature then, too yeah they, they got much you mature between 18 and yeah 22. yeah i guess stronger right. you know like i mean i was still strong and I, you know but I, was, I was more like endurance strong i think in in high school and i think if you look at the percentages at buds the older guys typically do a little better. Oh, is that right? I've heard, Interesting. I've seen some of the statistics. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, because you have more life experience. And what they found out in uh, in the UK was that when uh, like a U boat would hit one of these shipping a ship um, and like a merchant marine type vessel in the North Atlantic, and what they found is that hey, these young guys are the ones that are are dying before they can be be rescued. They're like, why are these older guys surviving? And it's because they had this life experience, especially back then. Sure. Like when life was a little little harder just all around, um, those guys had this life experience. They've sure. been tested before, uh, whereas all of a sudden this 18-year-old kid is in the freezing water in the North Atlantic, and he's, you know, anyway. So they, they looked at those numbers back then, and that's how Outward Bound started, which is okay. uh, takes kind of young people in, in, uh, in high school and college and gets them out backpacking and rock climbing and ice climbing, mountaineering, canoeing, all that sort of thing, because they wanted, it started in the UK and they wanted to take young people and test them and put them in these uncomfortable situations uh, to help them later in life, no matter right. what happened um, or what they had to face. So, uh, so yeah, it makes sense then that some, like if you have a little more life experience that uh, you'll have dealt with maybe some more, some more issues that you had to overcome and, and, uh, and work your way through. So I think that does make sense. So for me, it worked out yeah. and for you, it worked out. And that's why people, I think, connected us right away because back then, I think more people now going through buds have college degrees. It wasn't as um, prevalent back in the, the late 90s, mid 90s time frame. You know, some people did, but now I think it's a lot yeah. more. But, um, but I think that's also why people connected us right off the bat because they're like, oh, this guy did something similar yeah. to you, you know, and, and he has a bunch of knives in his locker. <laughs> <laughs> Go steal some. So, so you guys are going to hit it off, which we, which we did. Um, so you're in college, you're working your way through college, you're still, you're focused. Are you starting to go to a recruiter and ask some questions or? The, uh, I had some problems with my ear, uh, my eardrum. I had ear, ear problems a lot when I was a kid. And uh, so I, I got scuba certified, civilian scuba certified. As wanted to I. make sure yep, I, was, yep. I was heading in the right direction. Nice. I like um, it. And I went to, uh, bottom line, there were some issues with my ear that the Navy MEPS folks, remember you did the military yeah. entrance processing, right, exam, right. whatever it's called. But, uh, that they spotted the issues with my ear and they're like, hey, we, we're not gonna clear you, certainly if you wanna join the Navy and go SEAL teams. I'm like, oh, shit, I hadn't thought about, hadn't thought about this one. Um, so while in college, I did the Army ROTC program, thinking, okay, maybe this is a good backup. Um, I did you do it the whole time or did you just do like a year No, I did it for two years. Um, I did Army jump school through as a cadet. Oh, nice. And, and I talk about it in my book, but right, I go to, I go to boot camp. I'm an Army ROTC cadet. All I've ever done is read about the, the team guys, right? Yeah. After Buds, they go to Benning and go through jump school. And I'm sitting there at lunch one day, and I've got the high and stupid haircut and the super shiny boots, and the, I'm, I'm playing playing the game. Yeah. And these team guys who I think are like, you know, hairy-chested frogmen, little did they probably just graduated right. Buds yeah. three weeks prior. They're like a year but, older than uh, But they're sitting there with longer mm -hmm. hair. They're not necessarily playing by all the rules. And I'm sitting across from this guy at, at lunch and I'm like, man, you know, in my mind, I'm thinking all I ever want to do is be a team guy. And here I am, I'm a cadet. And then he's like, hey man, can I ask you a question? I'm like, oh wow, I get to talk to one of these guys. Yeah. He's like, what's up with the haircut? <laughs> and I felt so stupid because I'm sitting there with my, my high and stupid haircut. I'm like, this isn't even what I want to be doing. I want to be one of those guys with the long right. hair yeah, yeah. and, oh, yeah. and uh, doing that thing. So I got back from jump school and dropped out of the ROTC program. 
when had some more medical tests run on my ear to make sure it was good to go, and then finally joined the Navy. That is funny. If you, yeah, uh, I did a similar thing. We, we haven't talked about this in 20 years, I don't think, but uh, I did the same thing, but I just did a year and right. did the Ranger Challenge team, which oh, I yeah. thought was cool because there was like yeah. six or eight people it like on it, I forget. Thing to do yeah. in uh, the, uh, the regular one was like, yeah. uh, it just confirmed that I did not want to be in the Army. You know, because at, at that point, I'm like, well, I'm here. I'll explore my, explore sure. my options, check out this ROTC thing. Um, so yeah, I did it for a year. I loved the Ranger, Ranger Challenge team because you got up at you know four thirty in the morning, and you trained with these. And you, the one rope bridge competition. Right, yeah, yeah. What else was there? You some shooting stuff. There was M sixty, M sixty, and M sixteen assembly and disassembly. Oh, yeah. um, and you did this competition, Grenade, oh. and uh, but it was really it was that was fun. It was awesome. The ruck, cause I could put on a ruck and just go right. back then, you know. Um, and so there was a ruck, and I forget. It was pretty serious though. It was like. 14 miles, 15 yeah. miles or something like that. Um, and orienteering, uh, what else did they do? There was like 10 different things that you did, yeah. I think. But that was cool. But then the rest of the program was like. You got the Ranger Challenge tab. Yes. And so, yes, right, in ROTC, tab. you got the little Ranger mm -hmm. Challenge tab. That was big Nobody time. explained that to me, that that's a kind of a bullshit tab, right? I show up at jump school with my Did little, you wear it? Yes. Oh, that's hilarious. Nobody told me otherwise. Nice. That's awesome. And, and of course, all the, all the actual, some of the tab guys run around. Like, where, take that off? Yeah, yeah, so. That's but that part was cool. So I did like like that. It did give me a little bit of a glimpse into the Army, just confirming that, hey, SEAL Team is where I want to go, especially back then when yeah. all you have is, especially that year, the Marcinko book hasn't, hadn't even come out yet for me. That was still a year away in, during my first, uh, first year in college. Yeah, when Rogue Warrior came out. I've never bench pressed uh, 500. That was, I gotta be honest. <laughs> Everyone bench presses glass. 500. <laughs> yeah. I remember reading that part and that yeah. was like, oh, damn. I'm like, I don't know that I'm going to be able to do I this. I know. Everybody bench presses. Was it 500 five this times? sweet, but I, I don't know about this 500 pound thing yeah. and everything else. Was it, was it 500 five times? I don't or know. Or was it just was. once? I forget, something. but I distinctly remember reading that in the book and being like, oh, man, I got to stop running as much and get in the gym and start throwing some weight yeah. around here. Um, but that came out, you know, during that during that time frame of, of course, you know, Marcinko's there on the cover with the long hair and, sure. and all that stuff. And some of those pictures of those guys in the 80s, you know, training was, were, was awesome. Uh, so, they, you know, that definitely confirmed that I was on the right path. Right like, track, these are yeah. my, yeah, these are my people, yeah. you know. Um, and, Although, uh, I'll be honest, I thought Rogue Warrior was a bit over the top. Even back then? No, back then I thought it was amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, but yeah. then years later, I kind of have my career yeah. and I'm like, Right. There are a couple of things in there that might be interesting. Uh, yeah, bit. yeah. But back then, when you're 19 years old, 18 years oh, old, that was like the heat. 18. Yeah, you would you would have been 17, I think, when it when it came out. I would have been 18, I think. Um, but I remember that I was so excited. Oh man! And then I waited. He came and did a book signing. And like I was there and I waited till I'd be the last person. And I, even though I was underage, I got a bottle of Bombay Sapphire, you know, cause I was his favorite in the book. And I waited till the last, like probably like everybody did at every book stop of his. And then went up and talked to him and gave him the, gave him the bottle. And of course I got the book signed and talked to him for a little bit. That's he, cool. he probably told me something like, never quit, you know, like, right. <laughs> you know, uh, that sort of follow your dreams, you right. know, uh, all that, all that sort of thing. But that was super cool for, to be able to, to meet somebody like that, sure. you know, especially back then when you didn't know any SEALs. There was nobody you could connect with because there's no internet, there's no Instagram, there's sure. no Facebook, there's nothing. It's just this mystery, essentially, with a few books. Yeah. Uh, the Discovery Channel stuff wasn't out yet at that time. That was still five years or so away, I think. There the Discovery was, Channel was um, like early yeah. on Team 5. I remember yeah. when the, the video game stuff, the SOCOM video game. That was a little that. later. Yeah, yeah. There was a platoon from Team 5 that like went out and – Shot the guns and they recorded oh, yeah. it all for the yeah SOCOM uh, yeah and then they did a couple more but well, uh, think, yeah even at the beginning of that video game they interviewed guys oh really yeah 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 so that's yeah that's getting us to a like that's the start of the wave you know I think the start of the swell um, of course that they helped create by doing that sort of thing but um, but yeah back then like there was also a Vietnam movie that they did in sixty eight or sixty nine uh, called Men with Green Faces and uh, and that was pretty cool because it showed training at the time i thought it was vietnam but now i'm thinking that it was probably like a canal in nyland um i'm not positive but they did show some vietnam stuff in there they showed the stoner okay. guys just rocking that stoner yep. um and uh of course back then you could buy a couple books from paladin press yeah for those who remember from the back of soldier of fortune magazine there was like there's always a insert in the middle from paladin press and it would be like these 
crazy awesome books um, and uh, a couple of them had stuff on the stoner and stuff about uh, about seals in Vietnam and, and that sort of thing but you really had to search it you know it wasn't it wasn't finding you right. uh, like it does today um, so meeting Marcinko up was pretty pretty cool so that comes out probably while you're while you're in college you stay you stay focused on it and then uh come back from jump school you're out of the arm out of the rotc program yeah, turn in drop, your tab drop the rotc turn in, thing turn in your cut, ranger cut challenge off my tab. ranger challenge yeah. tab and uh, swore i'd never do it again yeah. um dropping your badge on the desk and, graduated uh, and then and then uh by then there was no doubt in my mind i wanted to enlist yeah rather than do the officer exactly. thing it was uh you know keep my options open i could become an officer later if i wanted to how did you find out about that like how did you find out that hey there's these Through different the rotc thing because okay. the rotca was officer based and yeah. so kind of figuring it all okay. out um and so yeah and, and i had i think it in college and again small school uh a former team guy had just gotten out, done two platoons right before okay. they'd ever done anything. But yeah. in my mind, he was a, a war hero. Right. Um, and he uh, he talked to me a lot about enlisted officer and was like, hey, if you want to have some more fun and nice. be the point man and do okay. the, then do, you do a little more of the enlisted side. Yeah. Like, okay, cool. Start there. Yep. No, that's awesome. Cause I didn't have, I didn't know anybody like that, but the Marcinko book talks about it because he was enlisted first. And I think that's one of the first times where it really clicked. Like it should have in all the movies that I watched, but it was still confusing back like in yeah. the eighties. Like, what is this? I don't understand. Um, but in that Marcinko's book, of course he talks about being enlisted first right. and then becoming an officer. And for me, I was like, ah, that's it. And then like Patches Watson had a book about Vietnam and I was like, oh, now I'm starting to figure it out. And then I start to note in these books that came out the difference between officer enlisted and who's a sniper and who's not who's and a, why yeah. what jobs and all that sort of thing. So once you kind of get that baseline and once I got that that baseline um, and that, that Marcinko book was definitely you know influential to to me. And then he was on on 60 Minutes, of course, at the time. And um, but when he had the way he talked about officers also, it confirmed once again that popular culture because growing up, in the 80s, every Vietnam movie and TV show, they had the brand new officer that would show up in Vietnam and make everybody that was crusty and had experience out there shave, get haircuts, starch right. uniforms, salute, and then they he'd lead them right into an ambush, right. like every time. And so then I started putting it together like, uh, okay, now I get it. That's the officer. Uh, doesn't know what he's doing. <laughs> he's going to lead these guys right into an ambush. Right. Now I understand. And then the way that Marcinko talked about him in, that, in Rogue Warrior, I was like, okay, now I see why people don't like officers. And so for me, that solidified all that stuff I had watched from the 70s all the way through the 80s. Right. And then started picking up from the way these guys, then the few books that started to come out in the later 80s, early 90s, was like, ah, okay, I remember now I see why people don't like officers. When I first got to my previous command, this old crusty master chief was like, hey, listen, the officers are temps around here. Renting the lot. And, and we're full time. Mm -hmm. right? you'll, you'll be here for years. You'll be doing this as long as you're alive. Yeah. And the officers are temps, they'll rotate. And that, that's the name of the game. No, no yeah. harm, no foul. That's just yeah, the way that's how they it goes. Rotate out. That is how it goes. But yeah, that was, so I, so I, I got, I kind of figured it out also. And then knew that I wanted to be a sniper and hey, these officers aren't snipers. Um, and it doesn't seem well, like then they your, can shoot Your officers well. that were prior enlisted always had much more respect because guys look at them and be like, oh, okay, they, they've done the stuff we've done. They've yeah. Done. Yeah. That definitely, that definitely helped to have that, uh, you're building that, that reputation based on your character, your skill set, and of course, you all you know how to operate a radio. You can run, you know, you can get on the right. A dub. You don't have to be totally clueless right. uh, about those things like uh, like most most officers. Um, but uh, did so when you walked in and did the. Uh, went to the recruiter, did you think you were going to, like, I thought I was going to walk out the back door. I thought it was going to be like Forrest Gump. I walk in, I sign these papers. I knew about the dive fair program because I'd right. done, done the research ahead of time. And then I found out you had to wait. I was like, wait, what do you mean? I thought I was going to get on the bus and it was going to drive me to right. boot camp. And then, you know, I'm going to get off and start getting yelled at. Did you have a better sense of I, that you have to, it's going to, it's a little bit of a process. Yeah. Yeah. I went in and, and again, I mentioned I had this friend that I'd met in school who was a former SEAL. Mm -hmm. So when, I told him I was interested, right? He, he tried to mentor and help any way he could. So when I went to the recruiter's office, he's like, I'll go with you. So he oh, just awesome. rolled in right next to me, never introduced himself, didn't say anything to the recruiter, just sat down and I'd start talking. And anytime I'd have a question, I'd look at my friend and he'd either shake his head yes oh, or wow. no. Yeah. And I'd look back at the recruiter and be like, no or yes. Oh, and man. you know, the recruiter's trying to figure out who my buddy is. Uh -huh. So I got a, I did the dive fair or seal challenge program. Dive fair just changed the seal challenge ah, at the time. So seal challenge had a, like a three months to kill. Okay. Uh, drove up to Alaska, spent a summer in Alaska. Oh, nice. and oh you drove all the way up? Shipped, yeah. That's awesome. I've always wanted to do that. Then, uh, yeah, with a college buddy, 
Just nice. did a little road trip, backpack for the summer. Nice. And then uh, came back and went to boot camp. Man, that is awesome. I went to Alaska, same thing, while I was waiting. Uh, uh, but there was, yeah, th three months up there, but I flew. Uh, but I always wanted to drive. I always wanted to drive my, uh, like an old VW bus up that highway, you yep. know, and then just head into the backcountry. Um, yeah, that, but, uh, but yeah, I thought that, that helped too, you know, because you're, you're in the backcountry, uh, you're pushing it, you have a heavy weight on your back, so you're rocking every day, um, just because that's how it is. Yeah. Um, so, I, so I thought that was very, very helpful, but it took me a little more, a little longer because for whatever reason, there was a backup uh, in 90, 95, 96. It just took a little, little while. I had to wait, I had to wait, I had to wait the my turn. Right. And it wasn't like, uh, it wasn't like I thought. So finally, yeah, finally, finally my number came up and eventually got on the bus and then flew to Great Lakes and, and did that thing. But the dive fair program, that was a scam. Was it? That was a scam because Everybody that I was in boot camp with got to try out. And when you sign up for the dive fair program, what I wanted was just a chance to try out. That's all I want. Right. I just want a chance to try out for uh, for buds. And they said, well, here's the dive fair program. And I already knew it from from reading, but you sign on for six years. And that said so they guaranteed you this right. the spot. So I was like, that's what I want. Six years, sign up, and uh, that guarantees me the spot to try out. That's all I want is my opportunity. And, uh, of course, I didn't know that everybody got to try out in boot camp. You didn't need to sign on for six years ahead of time. It was right. just like a hook to, to get you in there so that when you fail out, uh, Did like you get 80%. A bonus or anything? No, you don't get I think eventually maybe there was some sort of a little. No, SEAL Challenge. Maybe, maybe there was a, a little, little bonus for SEAL Challenge. And then they had like a, a $30,000 bonus that they ran. It definitely wasn't 30000 Five, 10 years after yeah. we went through. <laughs> yeah. But they. I remember when those ones that, came out. And then out. they shut yeah. it down because yeah. everybody was paying me to get through buds. Yeah, that's a, a weird one. You know, what, like what motivates people and what you're going to do to incentivize people when you need more of something. Um, and it's just it's very interesting how our senior level leaders can't figure that out, uh, especially when it's like your only job to figure that out. Uh, and they thought paying people more would bring in. Yeah. The right kind of guy. I don't know. It was like um, ten grand per phase or something. Oh, I remember that. Yeah, right? it was like yeah, ten that's grand right. to graduate. I didn't first get that. Phase, yeah. Second phase, third phase, and then that's all weird. we created was a whole bunch of young seals that just want to get paid to do anything, and it, it just changed the whole mindset. So they, yeah. I know they shut that down, but that was definitely a thing for a while. Yeah, that's a weird thing. I mean, I guess it worked out for the local Harley Davidson dealership because <laughs> um, right. everybody just go out and spend it immediately. So it probably helped you know the economy in general a tiny bit around uh, around Coronado. But uh, yeah, it's a weird way to do it. I think you know, just incentivize people by giving them a little more, you know, a little more money when you're when you're when they're in the testing phase. I think just, most guys are in the teams for the money. Yeah, no, that's if you want to make a lot of money, it's probably not the yeah <laughs> not the way to go. I would have paid to have done the job. That's like even in like when I was very young and all the way through high school and college and all the rest of it. Like I looked at it like I would, I would pay to do this job. Like this is where I'm going, and uh, I'm going to do everything I possibly can to to prepare more myself. More people should follow what they're passionate about, yeah. right? I, I, I didn't care what they paid me because yeah. I was so passionate about the job and, yeah. and you know, I, what I'm doing now, what you're doing, what other people are doing, right? They get out of the military. It's about finding something they're passionate about and following that. That's it. Don't go to work miserable every day. Yep. No, and eventually <laughs> like the money, the money will come, you know, eventually if you're doing something you're, you're passionate about, you know, there's uh, like the writing thing for me, like it's probably, if you want to make money, it might not be the place to, to go, but if you love writing and love telling stories and love uh, getting better at it each time, you know, eventually the, the money may come, um, but you got to do it because you, you love it. Otherwise you're going to be, be yeah. miserable. But uh, so yeah, so you go hit boot camp. And then, what did you? What was your uh, your rating? I was a torpedo man. That's right. So I went to uh, right so source the ratings. There's source ratings. Yep, a seal challenge, seal source rating. Um, we're like, hey, you know, you take the ASVAB, you qualify for all these all these different jobs. I'm like, sweet, I don't care. You know, gunner's mate, or that's probably Most what people, you were, right? No, I did, I did I, I, IS, okay. Intel. So that was, that was short. Intelligence that was specialist. A small one. Well, no, it was, uh, it was 16 weeks and plus a couple weeks on either side oh. waiting for your, your class when okay. you're mopping the floor Mine was at the Intel school. Eight to 10 weeks, and we learned how to like wax a torpedo, and that was it. Was, I was off the buds. Was that different than what's the difference between that and the mindman? Is there's a, it seems like there'd be overlap, but maybe not. I have no I don't idea. Know. No clue. So for those listening, we had these source ratings back in the day. Like now you go in and you become a, an SO, special operator, right? Um, but back then you could be a, like you could be a photo journal or journalist or something like that. There were some weird there ones, but there ratings. was gunner's mate, bosun's mate, intelligence specialist. Uh, there was like a list of, I don't know, 10, 15 yeah. different ones. I don't know how many the Navy had in general, but uh, I think our friend, uh, our friend, uh, Mark G, I think he was a mineman, I want to say. You see that? Something like that. Not sure what that means. But most people don't know. I mean, people, yeah. you know, they just want to get to buds. I just, I, they were like, torpedo man, 
10 weeks, I'm like, sweet. Run to that. It's quick. It's easy. It was in, it was in Great Lakes. The okay, boot camp so you just there, stayed there. A school and then straight to Bud's. Okay. Interesting. Yeah, so I went to, to Intel School um, with some some great guys that uh, that, are, that, uh, that you've worked with in the past, and we had a, a core group of us out there that just worked out every day and got to buds and went through buds together, and then went nice. to our went to our teams. And um, yeah, so it was it was it was cool. It was cool, but it was all based on total Tom Clancy, 1980s Soviet threat, and this is 96. 96. And uh, I, mean, I remember I could have made it through that course. I could have tested out of that course because of all the reading that I had done, done up to that point over my life. Like I could totally have have done that. Um, but it was it was interesting to see how they were still so focused on uh, on that Soviet sure. uh, Russian threat then. But uh, but you're still talking about those uh, the submarines and the ships, and you're looking at the silhouettes, yeah. and you're doing you know yeah, what kind of planes? All that sort of exactly exactly. I'm like I remember this from. Tom Clancy from all those military books I read growing yeah. up. You know, what kind of helicopter is this? So we have torpedo men, we have mine men, we have journalism, we have photojournalism, we have things that guys are never gonna do in the SEAL teams. And I think that thought behind that was, hey, 80% of these guys are not gonna make it through. So let's, uh, let's teach them something ahead of time so that as soon as they fail out, they're into something productive. Uh, right away in the fleet. Right. Uh, it's like a, it's like the, the a recruiting tool essentially, like the Blue Angels. You know, someone's like, oh, "I'm going to do that one day," and they're like, "We walk into the recruiter's office and they're like, have we got a job for you, Torpedo Man?" Yeah. You know, and then uh, or, or you want to be a SEAL because you saw the movie, and then all of a sudden you're a you know whatever a mineman, and you don't make it through buds, and off you go to the fleet, and you're like, "Oh man, okay, mineman, here I go." Uh, to some degree, I, I think I picked Torpedo Man because I did not want to be a torpedo, <laughs> right? So that was extra motivation for uh, me to just be like, look, if you decide to quit buds for some reason, yeah. you're, you're going to some place that you really, really know that you're not interested in. Interesting. So don't even entertain yeah. the thought of. That's quit. a good way to go. I should have probably done that because I was, I was legitimately interested in the Intel field and I didn't really know what they were going to teach me at Intel school, which ended up not being that much, um, especially with the two weeks of mopping the floor. I think it was actually longer than two weeks because you had to wait for your class to start up. I just missed one. I think it was a, I was there for a Mopping's while. Mopping is very important precursor to Intel It school. is. And I remember yeah. this was my day. I would uh, start in the morning with the bottom level of uh, the Naval Intelligence School at Damneck, Neck, Virginia. And I'd start with the bottom level in the morning, mopping, work my way the whole morning along the floor, and then... Go to lunch, come back, go upstairs. Afternoon was mopping, but it was a that was a clean floor. Like I was probably <laughs> the, I, I don't want to brag, but uh, I might have been the best mopper that uh, the Intel School has ever seen. Do, I don't know do that you for a still fact. Use your mopping skills for this day. <laughs> never the same thing. Like I never I never make the bed. I never uh, fold the clothes like we were taught. <laughs> right. Um, I shouldn't say I never make the bed. I throw the sheet. But the one boom, that's done. Right. Uh, so for me, I think it was one of those like in Sears School, those little victories. They say get those those small victories. Okay. Uh, if you're ever captured and you're in a Vietnamese prison camp, um, then that's the small victories that are the ones that uh, that'll, that'll that kind of keep you going. And uh, so for me, that's my small victory is that uh, I don't fold my clothes the way. And I got it twice. Okay, I got boot camp folding of the clothes. And I got OCS folding the clothes, which are oh, exactly the same, except in OCS, the Marine drill instructor's yelling at you, right. uh, like an officer and a gentleman. And then in the Navy boot camp, it's the, the Navy, right. you know, the, but the folds yelling are the same. at you. The folds are the same. Yeah, that's true. From what I remember. It's not an officer but, fold. Uh, yeah, same thing, thing with the bed, right. you know, same, okay. same type of deal. Um, I, I mop my garage to this day. You do? Oh, yeah. Oh, man. Oh, that OCD, yes. I think my wife wishes that I had taken some of these <laughs> lessons and I would fold the clothes and make the bed, but uh, she's given up at this point. It's been 21 years that we've been married, and she's, yeah, I think I think last year or the year before, she finally gave up. Like, it's not it's not happening. Um, but uh, so, bam, right into, into after torpedo in school, you're into buds, and Into buds, bam. and I went straight through. Got lucky enough, no roles, no anything, stayed nice. healthy, graduated 226. That's a great number. And then, uh, yeah. Right here. Yeah. This thing like it was made for my hand, the SIG P226. Yep. And uh, that was, that's a cool, that, you had some solid people in that class. We had a phenomenal class. Yeah, you had a really good some class. Heavy hitters in that. Uh-huh. Yep. To this, yeah, to this day, sure. they're, I mean, our they're legends. Timing, right, in hindsight, sold pre-9-11. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, little timing. did we know what was coming down the pipe as soon as we graduated and, you know, the first couple, I mean, basically my yeah. whole career, but. Yeah, no, that was the, you couldn't have had better timing. So I had that one pre-September 11th deployment. You had two weeks into that one. September 11th happened, but yeah, my first pump, 9/11 happened. 
Yeah, a couple weeks, a couple weeks in. Yep. But but you weren't just didn't just graduate. You were the honor man. I did okay. Nice. And I, yeah, yeah, that's pretty that's pretty serious. So you graduate honor man. What do you have trouble with anything in buds? Like how that, all that training that you did and everything that you read. Did you feel like From you were Alaska, as prepared? So not the strongest swimmer. Yeah. Um, so didn't necessarily like the, the water as as much. I yeah. probably should have been a little more comfortable in the water, yeah. but I, I did not. Uh, I just didn't grow up around pools and swimming a lot. Um, so I'd say swimming was probably my weakest thing. Yeah. But I got lucky, and and my swim buddy was a naval academy guy oh, nice. who who would always guide right okay. on the long swims. That's important. And, and so I I literally would just never pull my head out of the water. I'd stare at his fins because uh, he was always about four feet in front of me, yeah. and just work my ass off. And and so we got through all the swims and yeah. For those good. listening, guiding is so you're out, you know, you're off the shore, but you can still weave as you are swimming and turn that. What is it? Two nautical mile ocean swim, three. What was right? What are two whatever, two mile time swims? But you could be yeah. You could turn that into three <laughs> or four by doing this thing. Yeah. And uh, guiding. I remember coming out. I was the worst at guiding. I was not good. So I look. I got lucky with someone that eventually we just let him do it. Right. Um, pick up your head and you try to like line things up on the shore because it kind of curves and you can see some like Point Loma in the distance or whatever. So the, the idea was you would line two things up and if you got, if you came up and picked your head up and they were not lined up, yeah. then you're off track. And so you got them back in line again. Yeah. That was the idea. Yeah, like, that's, that's why I never did it. I was I always did. like, wait, what one did I line up? I think that was it, <laughs> you know, and, and you're underwater most of the time, just coming up to take that breath and go back under. But guiding is definitely an art. Yeah. You know, there's a little, little bit of science to it, but I think there's a lot more of that, that art and that, and that feel. Uh, Water stuff it. was definitely my weakest. Yeah. But just the swim part or like the, uh, when you got to second phase, like the, the, uh, uh diving was, uh, done a little bit of diving. Civilians diving is way different than the draggers and, and whatnot. Mm-hmm. But, um, how about like first phase drown proofing and <clears throat> life saving and those okay four things that we do stuff, not, that underwater. All definitely time. made me nervous. Cause yeah. I, again, I didn't go in as a strong swimmer, but I think, um, where I was better, I was just, I'm better at maybe being a little more calm in some of those situations. So I think that ability helped me in my, yeah in my situations that I wasn't that strong in. Yeah. Yeah. Same thing with me. I, I got very lucky in that somebody took me aside after I was like third to last on one of the first swims. I was like, oh man, what is this stroke, this underwater recovery stroke? Like I'd yeah. seen it at that point. I think the discovery thing may have just come out the first one. Um, and so I think I, I'd seen it on TV, uh, but I didn't really know quite how to do it. And um, so it's a, it's a uh, uh, underwater recovery stroke. So your feet are like freestyle, but it's on your side and they're underwater and you have fins on and then you're doing the side stroke with your upper body, but you're only bringing your, your head out for a little bit and then going back down. So so I remember this guy who was a water polo player in college. He just took me aside. He was like, hey, let's go out to the after, after work. Uh, and we went out in the ocean, and he just taught me the, the technique. That's and cool. then I went from third to third from last to third. Yeah. And I was never third again, but I was always, you know, I was, wasn't worried about it after that yeah. after that point. So now they teach you. Now, now, now they, they teach, teach you. you swim strokes. And, mm-hmm. I, and they should. It's smart. Yeah. That's, a, that's a good I, I wonder how many guys, like, we lost it. We're so good. Sure. Because Could have they been just phenomenal could, guys. Yeah, they just couldn't just pass because the they didn't time. quite get that technique. Yeah. Uh, and no one. So now they teach you the technique ahead of time. And I think that I think that's better too. Uh, and then third phase, you get out to the island, crush some demo, that shoot, was, no that problems. That was more my game because I run around with a AR-15 since you know yeah. middle school. Um, so the shooting, land warfare, land nav, all that stuff was just that was my happy place. Yeah. That was it. Yeah, that's a good one out there. And then back and then right to, you didn't have to go to jump school with your class then. No, because I'd already been to jump school with Army ROTC. Yeah. I checked into five and I, I believe that's why I got a uh, spot okay. was because I had already been through jump school and a lot of the other new guys mm-hmm. coming out of BUDS at the same time had to still go to jump school. Yeah. I was a, a month or so ahead of them somehow because of yeah. that. And so they dropped me in the but. Yeah, and so there we go, and start uh, start that workup, and then it's I think it's a full eighteen month workup that we had at that point. Yep. You know, you jumped in probably um, I think kind of right when the workup was about to start, yep. um, and then uh, went all the way through that workup. Nyland, uh, I forget if we, what did we go? Did we go to Washington State? I think we might have gone to Washington State with that one. I can't remember, but I remember at Nyland we have some cool pictures from yep. out there oh, yeah. wearing like the what were the, the chocolate chip tops and then like yeah. <laughs> like yeah, no <laughs> night. Vision. All them fours yeah. or iron sights. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I might have had crazy. like the Aquila. Remember the night vision oh, scope? Oh yeah. The point. Because you were point. Were you point man? Yeah. So you had the one. The, the one. The, the one night, night vision, vision scope. Uh-huh. Yeah. 
So no body around. armor, no helmets. No body armor, no helmets, and ragtag uniforms. Uh, yeah, I remember we had chocolate chips and the uh, and and uh, woodlands. Yeah, yeah, you know, it all and little soap patches sewn or whatever. But uh, that was cool. That was fun. That was a good. That was a good time. It's definitely old school. Yeah, yeah. No, it was, I'm glad I got it. You know. A taste of that, I guess, because then you got to see how things evolved sure. and how quickly they evolved. My class was one of the last classes at Buds to go through in greens. Oh wow! Right, we got camis, I think, in third phase when we went to the islands. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think did you have Mark One Motto Navy dive knife? Yeah. Okay, because yep. they switched that also. Yeah, and yeah. I think they, they might have switched blade it now. around. Uh, I don't yeah. know when they switched it, but maybe around the time the they switched Navy it. The Navy dive knife. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. I still have my original. Oh, I got a couple. <laughs> nice, nice. Yeah, I got the original, and uh, yeah, that was that's, that was cool. That's where I really learned to sharpen. And on yeah. that stone, you know, I got really good at sharpening sharpening blades back then. But uh, yeah, that's that was yeah. I sh the only time I ever sharpened knives, I think, in my career was. But you just get after that, I'm like, I need a new one. <laughs> <laughs> Give me a new one. Time. It does save this time. Knife's dull. I get know. a new one. <laughs> I know, I know. Uh, but yeah, but you can tell. Like you can tell that that knife is so like worn. Yeah, and the blades have. Oh, so great. I mean, because because if you're lined up for that swim, and it didn't, didn't happen to me, but uh, I remember people next to me just had that rock. I don't know if they did that in your class. A guy would come by with a rock, and if your knife didn't shave shave hair, you take that rock and just take that blade and, and just smash <laughs> it, and then just. <laughs> And then you had to spend a lot more time right. you're getting that thing sharp. So <laughs> mine was always uh, always good to go. I got pretty good at those different stones and, and, get, and getting that just right. But uh, but yeah, you get to get to that get to team five, go through that that workup, and then you guys deploy to uh, Okinawa, right? Okinawa. That's where we watched 9/11 unfold on my barracks room television. Mm -hmm. Like wow, was, this is all going to be over bef before we even get home from deployment. Yeah. yeah, everybody thought we were missing it. Mm -hmm. Like dang, I wish I was team three right now. You know, that was everybody, you know, man, Team 3, they're, they're going in. Right. Um, with, with their desert. Yep. Their desert gear. Mm -hmm. We're sitting in Okinawa, Japan with all our cold weather equipment and gear. Team three's the desert team at that time. Yeah. Yep. So we were even closer in that we were in Guam, but we flew to the Middle East with all that cold weather gear. And I think we ended up giving some of it to Team 3 so that they could go and, and do do the missions. Right. And we then took over their mission of doing the ship boardings Shipboarding. for the, uh, to enforce that UN embargo, which was kind of cool to do that looking back at the time. Of course, no one wanted to be there because we thought we were missing it. Sure. Obviously, <clears throat> now 20 years later, that was not uh, that was not really a threat. But uh, but yeah, so we got to do those ship boarding operations. Team 3 got to go in with our cold weather gear and uh, and get after it for a little bit. Yep. And then, and we thought, oh man, now we're getting back in this rotation when we come home we're definitely going to miss it now yeah. this thing's going to be wrapped up before we get back and it could have been i mean it, it's uh december 2001 when uh the special operations forces and cia guys are on the ground in in tora bora and bin laden is in the the tora bora k plant complex that he knew very well from his time as a uh, working with the Muj in the in the 80s and they're requesting. They requested, I think, because now more and more documents are, are coming out uh, through Freedom of Information Act requests and two lawsuits against the federal government by the Washington Post. And so all these documents are coming forward. All these oral histories that people thought were going to remain classified uh, are not. And they are out there now. And, man, those guys asked for 1,000, 2,000 Marines, 10th Mountain Rangers, like, come in here, flood this place, block the border to Pakistan. Right. We've got them here. And instead, they didn't want to put a big footprint on the ground, didn't want that. Uh, huh. That that was the lesson that a lot of our senior level leaders took from, took from the Soviet invasion was that they had too many forces in there. So Tommy Franks, we had 20, 2,500 people in Afghanistan in December of 2001, and 100 of them were special operations and uh, some paramilitary guys that were essentially had bin Laden close right and uh and that did their, their request got denied and so what happens <laughs> off he goes sure um and the people that are afghan partners were people that we were just paying so they're warlords and militias that we're paying and now they're our friends well why are they our friends well because we just gave them 100 paying. grand <laughs> <laughs> so uh and it's crazy at the same time not the same time a little a little while after a few months later there are 4,500 troops in salt lake city for the olympics so, you know, almost double 
what we had in Afghanistan. We had that here in for the Salt Interesting. Lake. Yeah, crazy. Crazy, and then of course, this last year we had 26, 25 or twenty six thousand in uh, in the Capitol for for inauguration, but only twenty five hundred on the ground, and of those twenty five hundred, one hundred ish right. are uh, are in those mountains at the time. So, so it could have been wrapped up. So our fears were not unfounded that we might have missed it because sure. you could have missed it. Uh, had we we all could have missed it had uh, had that place got blanketed in troops and they just crushed Tora Bora, got Bin Laden back then. You know, maybe that would have been a different next twenty years. Thank you for tuning in to the Danger Close podcast, an Iron Cloud original presented by Six Hour. That was part one of a special four-part series with my dear friend, Mark Owen. And as you could tell, it was just two friends catching up. If you haven't picked up Mark's first book, No Easy Day, or his second book, No Hero, be sure and do that. And part two is next. And in part two, we really talk about Mark's career from September 11th up until the mission to capture or kill Osama bin Laden. So be sure and check that out as well. Thank you so much for tuning in. Sincerely appreciate it. Take care out there. Be safe. Keep fighting.